Hello, everybody. Um, so yeah, as, as, as Mara said, this is a pretty big project for us. We're, uh, we're not a huge company. This is probably the largest individual initiative that we've ever done. Um, but just to, just to kick things off, um, Routique is a, is a logistics and supply chain platform. So we work with companies like Nestle and Lactalis, lots and lots of food service, um, pharmace pharmaceuticals, but also dry goods, electronics, basically anything that needs to go from where it's made or, or where it's imported to where it's uh, sold or where it's consumed, uh, we help do that. So we move things, essentially, is what the platform does at a, at a high level. Um, our, our tagline is uh, X-ray vision for supply chain visionaries, and you'll see it's kind of marketing buzz, but you'll see how this actually fits into the project and what we're doing here um, fairly shortly. So. Um, the, the, the important part, again, marketing uh, speak to start with, but um, seeing through walls, breaking down barriers, peering into the future, it's all, it, it, it sounds, you know, fluffy and, and uh, sort of esoteric, but, but there's a, a method to the madness, and really what it is is can we give um, our customers the, the visibility and the transparency that they need through their network? Um, so really the, the, the problem in, in, in technical terms of what we do is supply chain orchestration. So just like a conductor in an orchestra, how do we get all of these different partners to work together? Uh, lots of people think, you know, uh, uh, you know, say Nestle, for example, ships all their product and warehouses it and transports it. Almost none of that happens. It's, it's quite rare for any entity, no matter how big they are. They're, they're, for example, the world's largest food service company. I think they're $145 billion company or something like that. Um, very little of that work once the product leaves the plant is, is actually done by them. So it's done by a disparate group of partners, some huge other juggernaut entities, international ones, other regionals, other nationals, all the way down to, you know, Ned's Trucking in Thunder Bay, Ontario. And so our job is to get all of these companies to work together as a single unit in one network. The complexity comes from the fact that a lot of those same companies work in 5, 10, 12 other networks. So you behave as as Nestle part of their entity when you're working with them, you then behave as part of Lactalis when you're working for them. So there's all these different rules and, and, and workflows and things that have to take place across the network. Um, that's the buzzword way of saying it. My favorite quote ever came from Nestle the very first day that we met them in their boardroom. They said, we don't want to own the trucks, we just want to act like we do. So that's the, the layperson's version of what we do. How do we make it seem and appear and function as if it's a single entity, a single network, when it's actually a whole uh, uh, group of, 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 of ragtag partners. So it turns out if you have the right platform and the right processes and the right data, uh, you don't necessarily need to own everything. You know, sort of the, the 80s, back when, when I was growing up, everyone was talking vertical integration. You know, we'll buy all of our suppliers, we'll buy all of our partners, we'll roll everybody up into one giant entity and then Companies realized we're actually not really good at running all those other businesses in all those other categories. Um, this is the modern equivalent. If you own the data stream, if you own the flow of data, uh, you don't necessarily have to own the, the physical assets, but you can perform the same function. So a little, little bit of what our platform does. There's quite a few pieces we have similar to uh, uh, what David was saying. We have uh, some, some IoT sensors in vehicles, in, in trucks and warehouses. We also have uh, a lot of handheld devices that support our platform, anything from you know, your regular iPhone or Android phone or tablet, uh, all the way up to Honeywell and Zebra devices and those kind of things. So we're gathering data. Uh, unfortunately, not the same use case as the last one. Lots of machine-driven data, but also tons of people-driven data, which uh, adds to uh, the complexity in terms of uh, how, how consistent and accurate that data is, which gives you lots of challenges when you start to do a project like this. Um, again, these are, these are what we call them our three pillars, but it's insight, foresight, and oversight. So insight is what the heck is happening today. It's like, what is the true picture of what's actually happening in our network? You would think a lot of times that a huge company would have that locked down. They absolutely do not. It's, it's a huge problem still in the industry just to know what is the reality of the current situation? Um, where is that truck? Where's that product? What's happening in that warehouse? What's happening with that customer? Uh, it's not a given, not by any stretch of the imagination, but if you can solve that part of the problem, then you can get more predictive, you can look at foresight. So it's how do I de-risk what might happen tomorrow? How do I capture opportunities in, an, in time to actually take advantage of them? How do I mitigate risks you know, before they happen or, or minimize the damage from them? And so there's obviously a huge machine learning uh, component in that. And then oversight is what I call compliance at a distance. It's, it's I don't own that truck. I don't, that driver doesn't work for me. That warehouse is not mine. It's leased, it's subleased. Um, how do I still 
make it behave the way I need it to behave, despite the fact that I actually have no sort of financial control over that part of my network. So it's, it's again, trying to create the illusion from the data point of view that it's one cohesive unit that all is working towards the common goal, when in reality there's lots of companies in there that have their own agenda uh, and it has to be managed. And, and again, you'll see, you know, see through walls insight. How do I take the roof off the warehouse? How do I know where the truck is? Um, peer into the future, foresight, and breaking down barriers is the oversight side. So how do I, how do I get them to perform? So there, there is a method to the, to the marketing madness. Um, just sort of bringing this one up uh, mainly for, for context. Um, so we, we did about a million orders through the system last year, about half a billion dollars of gross merchandise value. Um, we'll probably do over a billion this year. Um, and what that means is tons of data. <laughs> like every, every order might have you know, 20, 30 line items in it. Each one of those has a product, a SKU, a lot code, expiry dates, all those things. Uh, not to mention that to pick an order with you know, 32 SKUs in it and 700 items, uh, is every one of those actions is captured by our system. So there's, you know, it's like an iceberg, right? The data at the top of this order was processed actually might have hundreds of lines of, of uh, captured data underneath it. And then when you add the IoT side to do things like deliveries, it's, you see some time series data similar to what David was showing is, you know, what was the temperature at every moment during the journey? What was happening at that time? Um, you'll see incidents in the field like driving to a Walmart to deliver product uh, that you pull up to the dock door, they open your, your doors, they pull you up to the dock and they leave you sitting for 15 minutes. Then they scan your truck with a temp gun and go, you're over temp, we can't accept this ice cream or whatever it is. Uh, in reality, with those layers of data similar to what David was showing, you can go, yes, but geofencing shows I was at your dock, the door contacts show that the door was open, I was idle, um, the, the vehicle brain we call it, which is the sensor that goes in the cab of the vehicle, says that I was parked and I was at your location. And generally speaking, that's the, the, the arbiter of the sort of he said, she said thing. It's basically going, okay, well, we get it. We, th this is fine. We were never over temp until you arrived at our location. So layer, layers of data and, and context is what tells the story for us. And one single source of data is easily disputable and actually can be wrong, but when you layer them all together, it creates a picture similar to you know, a detective solving a, a crime problem, um, putting it all together and going, I can forensically tell what happened here uh, just by looking at the data alone. Um, so to jump into a little bit of the project, um, we've been employing machine learning, and I, I has, in this room I hesitate to sort of talk about what we've done ourselves in the same context as of what Amy has helped us do, but you know, tools like, like uh, linear regression, like uh, k-means and nearest neighbor clustering and things like that, we've been using these tools since, since we opened, um, and I'll, if there's time permitting at the end I'll show you a couple screenshots, but like our route planning and, and uh, route optimization system was actually built in-house by us prior to, to meeting the folks at Amy, uh, and it works really, really well, and it scales, um, there's systems out there like Orion with UPS and all these kind of things that are probably heads and tails better than what we built, but they cost tens of millions of dollars and they're difficult and expensive to deploy and they don't share that necessarily with everyone. So um, ours is purpose built for what it does. It'll do things like, for example, um, optimize 5,000 deliveries in the greater Toronto area in a morning, not knowing how many trucks it has and not knowing how many deliveries it has until 10 minutes before. So it's built for speed and it's heuristically accurate enough for what we do, but it's fast. And so that, that, that's oftentimes what we're looking for is um, not necessarily the most robust solution that gives you the 100% accuracy, but how can we do this at scale? Because if we said, give us 24 hours and we'll return results, they'd be like, we don't have that time. So a lot of times the right answer is the one that you can deliver on time. Um, but so to jump into this project, we. We, uh, COVID really threw supply chain for, I'm sure everybody here heard about all the shortages with toilet paper probably being the big one for whatever reason. Um, just everything that was just in time that had no slack in the system just completely collapsed under COVID. And all of our clients started going, okay, well, you guys are really good at getting product upstream to a warehouse and downstream to say a retailer or to home, a home, and especially with COVID with home delivery, what the heck's happening in the warehouse? Um, you know, we, it, 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 we fabulous visibility of every truck in the field everywhere coming in, going out, 
and then it goes into a big box and we have no idea what's happening to it after that. So issues with inventory, issues with product being lost or damaged, um, in inventory miscounts, so thinking that they had this much product to send to a Starbucks or a Walmart and then realizing that they didn't have it and then realizing that they don't know why they don't have it and they can't figure out what happened to it. Um, so we really kind of came up with the concept of how can we take what we've done in the field and bring it into the warehouse and, and really sort of get more um, robust control over what's happening there. And right about the time that we had met the folks at, at Amy and we were introduced to Scale AI, who's uh, one of the, you'll see in a second, one of the, the funder of the, the project, um, aside from ourselves. And, um, and, and all of a sudden we went, okay, we don't have to do this alone anymore. We don't have to you know, learn these things ourselves and, and hope that we're doing it the best way. We have uh, some experts to rely on that will give us some guidance. And at the same time, we met one of our clients, Big Rock Brewing, um, who worked out to be the perfect customer to try this on, A, because they had an appetite to try new things and not everyone does, uh, especially the bigger ones. Sometimes they move like tankers. They turn really slow and, and they're hard to get to, to maneuver into new, uh, new areas. And also because of COVID, we couldn't go anywhere. Um, Routique's mandate is to, is to go. We go to your facility, we help you retool, we help you um, improve your operation. We travel all the time, constantly. I think I was away for 160 days in 2019 and then zero for two years. So we had to focus on home and we found a great partner in our backyard who we could drive over and see at any time, which was awesome. And they're really, really um, interested in deploying new ideas, even if they're not 100% proven yet. So that's, for us, it was an ideal partner. Um, I just like this little graphic. I'm sure everybody's seen these before, but the, the water flowing into the cisterns and, and you know, which one overflows first, that's, that's at, a, at, at the dumbest down level, that's what we do with product. It's like, how do I assure that this group doesn't run out and isn't shorting customers? Because a shorted sale is the worst well, not the worst, but it's one of the worst things that can happen to you. Um, the other worst thing that can happen to you is overflow. Uh, we, especially with things like frozen and, and chilled products, if, it, if there's literally no place to put it, it's going to go bad. And, and we've seen customers have that with you know, $25,000 worth of seafood gone bad on the dock with no place to put it in a freezer um, because there's no orchestration from the top down. So. It, it's, a, it's a simple version of it, but effectively, if you had tens of thousands of these, the, this is what we do, is try to balance the flow of goods through the network uh, and make sure that nobody has too much, no one has too little, and then you get the complexity of things like code dates, so expiry dates, right? I might have it, but it might not be sellable anymore. I might have it, but I don't have the sales to support selling it before it goes bad. So it's how do we orchestrate the movement of the product in the entire network to make sure that we're optimizing the flow of product out the bottom in this case. Um, and, and one example in this industry, because it, 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 there's some nuances to it, is you'll tend to short the little companies and you'll provide every, fulfill the order for the large ones. So just use Walmart, for example. If Walmart orders 300 cases of ice cream and a little convenience store orders 30, the tendency is to go, well, Walmart's huge. So let's give them everything they ask for and let's short the little guys. In reality, that actually makes no sense because the little guys have a very limited shelf space. If they were ordering 30, they're probably blowing through 30. And if you analyze the historical data, the, the time series data of the sales and replenishments, they're usually ordering what they need to fulfill the orders for that day or those next couple of days. Walmart has larger storage capacity and can order 300 and sit on 300. And so what you really want to do is not optimize fulfilling the orders for your biggest customers. It's you want to balance what's going into what's going out. And you don't want to optimize the biggest sale one node down in the network. You want to optimize the most flow through the bottom. So the one place where everyone in our network, ourselves, the manufacturer, all the warehousing companies, transport companies, the retailers who sell the product, and even us who buy it, we all need it moving. No one makes any money if it sits. Sitting product is, is an expense. Moving product, getting closer to where it's consumed, is increasing in value. And you know, I'm sure everyone knows, right, when it's manufactured, there's a markup to wholesale, there's a markup to distribution level, there's a markup to retail, there's a markup to uh, the consumer. The markup represents the increasing value of the product as it gets closer to where it's used. So everybody makes more money when it flows through the bottom faster. So 
Uh, this project, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're the project lead. We're the platform that, that supports the, the data that is available uh, for the project. Most of the data actually is resident in our platform. Uh, we actually added a lot of, of, of schema, a lot of uh, structure to support uh, the additional information that we were going to need. And we saw this coming while we, we, while we were applying for funding and while we were working with Amy. So things like taking our warehouse management system and making it spatially and volumetrically aware. Um, you know, it, you, you think of you, everyone here has an address. You, you live somewhere. Um, a computer doesn't know what your address means. It, it needs to geocode it. It needs to know what, what latitude, longitude, where you are. If you want to map it, you have to translate the address into a, a geocode. Um, in the warehouse, same thing. I know that, you know, this is aisle one, bay two. If you've been to Home Depot or any of those, you've seen that labeling. That doesn't mean anything to a machine. It's like, where is that? Where is that aisle? Where's that bay? What level is that? What height is that at? So we actually added that structure to our system as part of the lead up to this project, because if we're going to do similar types of optimization in the warehouse as we do in the field, we have to have a way to translate addresses, which are the location of the, the storage location, to the, the physical location in XYZ space. So, and, and a lot of this work we did uh, you know, with Amy, because when we started discussing this, we, we uh, similar to what David was saying, we went, okay, well, here's the information we have. Here's the outcome we want. What pieces are we missing? Where do we get this stuff from? And some of it does come from third-party data, things like weather data and stuff we're ingesting, but most of it is, if we didn't already have it, we tried to add that structure. Um, so Big Rock, as I mentioned, is the adopter. Uh, Amy's really the brains behind this, so they're the ones that, you know, the sort of the, the rock stars that have helped us uh, level this thing up from what we would have done ourselves. I think we would have gotten part of the way to where we are now ourselves, maybe three years instead of six months, where we are today, halfway through the project. Uh, a lot more pain, a lot more blood, sweat, and tears, a lot more, you know, this didn't work and that didn't work. Um, they've really helped us accelerate that. And then scale, we couldn't have done this without scale because a lot of that, that funding has, has come from that side. So it's a nice kind of a, a, a four-way uh, partnership here that made all this possible. Uh, I don't want to dwell on too many of these, but um, really what we're looking for, you know, in, in, I mean, we're using Big Rock as an example because they're the adopter, but part of our mandate was like, if this just works for one customer or one company or one sector, we're, we're in trouble. Um, we have to make it somewhat agnostic, so we have to be able to, you know, train models on different data sets and then keep those segregated. Um, beer might be different in Calgary than it is in Edmonton. It might be different in Toronto again. But then ice cream is very different from beer. Water is different again. Milk is different again. Electronics are totally different. Um, for example, some products in our network are incredibly seasonal. Um, you sell way more ice cream in four months uh, around summer than you do in the whole rest of the year. Uh, the electronic goods and the electrical components are, are fairly not non-seasonal. So there's m much more of a, of a sort of a static... Um, uh, uh, line in terms of the of the uh, time series data, so we're using Big Rock's uh, requirements as as the starting point. But then we're going, okay, well, how does that how does that manifest in all of these different areas? But basically, the needs of the customers at the highest highest level are all essentially the same. It's like, how do we store the right amount of stuff? store the most amount of stuff possible, access the most amount of stuff possible, have the right mix of the things that need to be sold, um, and then keep that all in balance uh, on a regular basis. And then from an optimization point of view, it's like what's the most efficient way to manage these processes that happen. So um, that's essentially it. And we came up with three use cases, uh, all of which are being worked on right now, and all of which have these cool little kind of tangents and offshoots once you, once you get a piece of it going. Um, so the, the demand sensing uh, forecasting side is the starting point for all this. Um, we have clients that do a sales forecast once a year, and, and then they don't change it because it's very manual. It's incredibly difficult to uh, a, a ton of labor. And so you, if you forecasted in January 2020 your sales for the year, guaranteed you were way off because in March 2020, everything shut down. So um, it, we needed a, a much more uh, robust, much quicker process that could adapt. And we wanted to forecast, um, you know, sort of top down and bottom up and compare the two and do it on a skew by skew basis regionally everywhere we go. So it's not a forecast for a single product. It's not a forecast for um, a group of products. And it's not a forecast for a single location. It's forecasting 
the sales trends for individual SKUs in individual locations across the country at any given time. And that was the first use case, um, A, because it was pretty well defined. I think you know, there's lots of solutions out there and, and we've iterated through a ton of those with, with Amy. Uh, you know, from Arima and, and Sarima and Sarah Max all the way through to the things that we're doing now that are more advanced. And I, I loved actually the approach that the Amy team took because they went, well, we're not going to start with the most, the, the, the coolest, most cutting edge tech. We're going to start with the most basic stuff and we're going to get a baseline. So what's the point of going to reinforcement learning or deep learning if Sarah Max does the job? Um, so that we, we've iteratively gone from really well-defined easier to more complicated, and then we've looked at the, uh, the, the, the diminishing return, uh, or the ROI on going the extra mile. And, and at some point, if we didn't keep getting better results with these things, we would have just said, okay, well, that one's good enough. But we're still improving as we go. We're still seeing results improving, and we're only halfway through. Um, so once, once you sort of inbound go, okay, well, I could see what's coming. I, I can look at next week, I can look at the week after, I can look at next month. I, I feel pretty good within you know, a, a reasonable confidence band that I know what my sales are gonna look like, what my demand is gonna look like. Um, then I can start actually uh, you know, optimizing my operation to, to manage that, that flux. And two things, the, the other two use cases, pick optimization, it's, it's very similar to vehicles in the field in a lot of ways, and then in other ways it's quite different. So again, addressable locations with, with XYZ codes, you have to know where it is. Um, you've got all kinds of complexity to add on to it, like if, if I can pick, you know, if, for some reason, if I was picking flowers and beer, um, I'm not gonna put the flowers on the bottom of a pallet and put beer on top of it just because beer is farther away than flowers. I have to take into account weight. I have to in take into account stackability. Um, I have to take into account uh, bin sizes. So if I'm picking on a pallet, I, I can only fill a pallet. If I'm pulling stuff off onto a pallet and then taking that pallet to the door, I have to make a trip to the door each time I fill a pallet. So it's, it's, it's similar to taking a truck and driving it around a route. Um, but there's a ton of additional complexity. So when we thought of doing this, we went, well, we've already done route optimization in the field. How hard can it be? And the answer was pretty hard. <laughs> it was hard, way harder than we thought. And, and so when we got into it, and, and we have regular meetings every week uh, with the Amy team, uh, they, they were bringing up things that we hadn't thought of, and then we were bringing up things that they hadn't thought of, and they thought they had the perfect solution, and it didn't work, and we thought we had a solution, and that didn't work. Uh, and it was the collaboration that really kind of pulled that together. But the end result is I have to go around, I have 100 orders, 1,000 orders, whatever to pick today. What's the most efficient way to go pick those orders based on where that stuff sits now? And then the other nifty thing in a warehouse that you don't see in a field is um, in a warehouse, you have the, uh, the, the ability to change addresses. So you could move the products so that complementary products that get picked together are closer together. So that is called slotting in our, similar to, you know, if you had a bunch of mailboxes and you were dropping the mail in, you're finding slots to put the product. Um, pretty difficult to go, hey, Starbucks, would you move next door to Tim Hortons because it'd be way easier to deliver to you guys if you were next door. Um, that doesn't happen in, you know, outside the warehouse, but inside the warehouse, there's a really good use case for moving the product once and then periodically um, adjusting that slotting plan based on you know, flux changes in, in sales, adding additional SKUs, those kind of things um, that you can't do in the field because it's, I've yet to find a customer that's willing to move so that it's easier to deliver to them. Um, so that's, those two are sort of go hand in hand. If it's already there, how do I get to it? What sequence do I go in to pick uh, the product? But also, what if I wanted to move it around? And, and what if I just wanted to rearrange this aisle or this particular supplier? Or what if I wanted to retool my whole entire warehouse? And so that use case, uh, we, we, we had really high hopes for number one. We had fairly high hopes for number two. And then number three was a really stretch goal. And we're actually seeing pretty cool results for all three. To the, I was telling someone at one of the sessions yesterday, if we if we were told tomorrow we had to shut down the project at the end of June, we could probably call all three of those use cases successful. I think we're gonna squeeze a ton more juice out of it in the next six months, but we've already seen results that are, I think, better than both teams anticipated, which is, which is quite neat to see. Um, and then use case three is a blank warehouse, an empty space. How would I configure it? 
um, you know, you have walls, there's limitations unless you're gonna build onto the building. You have a ceiling height. You have access uh, limitations like HVAC and, and door sizes and there's an office here and we can't put pallets in it. And so given an empty layout, how would I optimize it? This was the one that I think even when I first pitched the Amy team, they were like, I don't, I don't know if that could be done. I'm not really sure. And we've actually found ways to do it. It's not going to do it by itself. I, I don't think you're going to use this algorithm and then just build the warehouse exactly the way it told you. But man, is it ever a cool tool for the groups that are actually going, where do I put the racking? How much? How high? How wide do the aisles need to be? How much can I store? How, how much can I access? And the, the interesting thing about this one is that you've got two competing parameters. You want to store as much stuff as you can. You want to access as much stuff as you can. And those two are diametrically opposed to each other. If I wanted to store the most amount of stuff in my warehouse, I would fill it, you know, Indiana Jones style until it was right to the front door. And then when I needed the pallet at the back, I would unload every pallet in the warehouse one at a time to go get to the back one. Not practical, but that's my maximum capacity is fill it. There's no space. Um, the, the, the access that's required is typically by SKU. So if I have you know, 10 rows deep of a product of pallets, as long as I can get to the first one, when I take the first one off, I'll have access to the next one. And when I take the next one off, I'll have access to the next one. But if I have 100 different products and they're all in a row, I gotta move that row to get to the last product. So the, what we're basically doing with this use case is going, how do I balance storage and access? And so you're able to use you know, these little sliders and go, what if I needed 100 SKUs? What if I needed 200 SKUs? What if I needed, what does that do to my storage? And this is really, really interesting use case, despite the fact that I think it's kind of the hardest one, because what warehouse managers tend to do, or what the, the C-suite of the warehouse tends to do to the warehouse manager is go, we have this much space. I've done the math. There's 14,000 square feet. I know a pallet is roughly four by four. That's 16 square feet. I can store eight high. That's how much I can fit. I'm gonna sell that. And then they completely hamstring the warehouse by overselling for too cheap because they overestimate how much storage they have. And in these use cases we're doing right now with, with our, own, our own warehouse and, and, uh, and Big Rock, um, when you ask the warehouse manager or especially the executives how many pallet positions they have, uh, especially if they have what's called block storage, so they don't have a physical rack space that they can count, they just have an empty space they could fill with pallets, they overestimate by something like 300%. It's, it's insane how much people think you can put in a space when they forget that you need to access it. Um, so just really kind of brief here, but um, you know, just three little kind of screenshots from um, some of the experiments that have been being run. Uh, so multiple different ways of forecasting the data against SKUs. We're testing it with as many different categories of products as we can from uh, multiple suppliers, not just Big Rock, because Big Rock is very alcohol driven and you know, there's some patterns in there that, that hold true for all types of alcohol. Um, so when you get all these other SKUs in there and you get all these other um, types of products, you start to see um, you know, how, how um, uh, robust a model needs to be to be, to be able to handle all those different types of data. Um, the Pickard optimization, if there's time at the end, I'll kind of show you where this is going because it's kind of a little bit more futuristic looking than the, than the screenshots. But um, you know, between our, ourselves and the Amy team, we actually built ourselves visualization tools to, uh, to see how these things work. So um, you know, when, you're, when you're building a pick list and, you're, and you're, you're predicting how much time it takes to get from one place to the other, how much time it takes to pick an item, um, and then you're sort of adding all that up, if you can't actually see what the, what the algorithm chose to do, it's really difficult to go, is that right? I don't know. Um, so we've done combinations of um, building ourselves visual tools, we've also had ourselves and the Amy team come to both of the warehouse locations we're using as test. Uh, we've had our team filming, so we're actually, um, it's a terrible analogy, but you know, going out and seeing the chimps or the gorillas in the wild and going, how do they behave? It's like, how does this really work? Um, it doesn't matter what our system says should happen if that's not what actually happens in, in the wild. So um, our tools will capture that data, they'll, they'll measure it, um, but when you're going in, uh, you know, setting up a new SKU or, 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 or testing a new, um, uh, picking on a new line with a new customer, 
uh, you have to start somewhere. So observational data on top of, um, of the simulated data seems to work really well. Uh, and then the spatial optimization one there in the corner too. So it's, it's actually, you know, much to uh, I think a lot of our amazement, coming up with some pretty viable alternative layouts for empty spaces which to me anyway, I mean other people who are you know, really skilled in, in AI and machine learning probably maybe don't think that's as amazing as I do, but the f it's like generative AI. It seems like magic when you're going, it's one thing to optimize a thing that exists, but it's another thing to ideate on a thing that doesn't exist. Um, and to me that's pretty cool. So the use case for a new warehouse is, is obvious. How do I organize a new warehouse? But um, what if you've been storing block storage forever and you decide you want to rack it? Where should the racking be? Those kind of things. So it can be a reorg as well. It doesn't just have to be a brand new warehouse. It can be, um, uh, you know, updating an existing layout and those kind of things as well. And this is this exists right now. It's pretty rough, but this is our first um, foray into uh, a, a, an auto-generated digital twin of the warehouse environment. So we're not using CAD. We're not um, using what you would typically see as a digital twin for a couple different reasons. One, um, I think Gardner uh, study recently said for warehouses it costs an average of $800,000 to make a digital twin and takes about 12 months. Like none of our customers will wait that long or pay that much. It's just not that interesting to them. And two is we're not a BIM company. We're not as concerned with the building envelope and vibrations of equipment and all those kind of things. We're concerned with the product inside. The building is ancillary. It has to be there to see where things are. But what we really care about is all those little blocks uh, and the movement of those. It's how's the product moving around in the space, both physically, like where it is, and then state-wise. Like it has been stored. It has been received. It has been picked. It has been packed. It has been claimed as a damage. It's now about to be destroyed or dumped or something like that. So state-wise and location-wise. And this thing assembles itself from the data in Routique right now. So if you if you create your positions and you ma manage those addresses and those locations, this thing will build itself um, right down to the envelope of the building and the doors and the locations and the sizes. So we could set one of these up probably 48 hours. It would be done. Uh, I wouldn't tell customers that, but we could. Um, and then with you know our vehicle brains in the trucks, you'll see those trucks arriving in the distance. You'll see them you know 25 percent opaque when they're this distance away with an ETA of 15 minutes and they'll get darker and closer and then they'll eventually back up to the door just as they're actually backing up to the door. You can have the warehouse workers seeing signage, which Routique also does, so the information radiators that are in the warehouse going, this truck's late, this one's early, restage that. The product that's sitting there is not the truck that's coming next. Those guys broke down on the highway or something like that. So trucks actually communicating with the warehouse machine to machine with no human intervention and then telling the humans uh, or robots, you know, in the future, uh, restage this, uh, re reorg this, change the wave of this, you know, this whole wave of picking we were going to do for this truck, that truck is now canceled, it's tomorrow, pick this one instead. Um, so this is where we're going with it. And the little pick bots that you saw on the screen with the, the black and white dots on it, um, they're actually little 3D pick bots. And so just like a video game, uh, you can see player characters and non-player characters. So you can see Susie and Ted running around in the warehouse doing what they actually do with our devices or wearables potentially in the future. The forklifts, the pallet jacks, everything have our software running in um, Honeywell RT10s. So they're basically just really fancy ruggedized Android tablets. Um, so when a forklift's moving around, you'll see it. When a person's moving around, you'll see it. When a pallet's moving around, you'll potentially see it if it's RFID tagged or if it's scanned. Um, and the vehicle's moving around, you'll see as well. So we're, we're, we're kind of going to the, to the full extent with this thing of visualizing the warehouse and digital twin, not just from the point of view of here's a meter that says how fast you're picking orders or how accurately, but you can actually see it happening. And then the idea of a non-player character would be the simulation side. So uh, you can do everything from pick an entire year's worth of orders of this new customer. So we, ha we have not yet to engage with them. We just close them. They send us their sales order data for the last year. We make some assumptions about how close we think that's going to be to the sales that we're going to see in this, in this environment. We pump that order data into the simulation, and we can watch this thing uh, literally watch it, but more likely headlessly perform a year's worth of order picking and then go, how much is this going to cost us? How, uh, do we have the storage space? How much labor do we need? You can also do nifty things like go, what if I added three more non-player characters? What if I added three pickers to my shift? What, what difference does that make to me? And then do the analytics, analytics to go, 
will cost me $25 an hour for each person, but I save this much, I get this much done faster, I can do this much throughput. So that simulation side, I think, is, uh, is gonna be pretty cool as well. Um, I'll take questions for sure, but uh, I, I'm just gonna kind of show you where some of this is going. So this is, a, this is customer facing, and this is actually um, rendered out versions that we've done for customers. So um, the, 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 the sort of flat shaded video game version um, has the ability to be rendered out as say a floor plan for a racking company to come in and generate the racking for you or uh, customers for marketing or things like that too. So we can really take these things and this is, actually is rendered by us. It's not a, it's not a, a screenshot. Um, you, we can actually take these things and use them for other purposes aside from just real time simulation. Same as a video game. You can turn the frame rate down, you can turn the polygons down, you can get a kind of a really fast running version or you can crank it up if you've got 18 video cards and you can make it look absolutely amazing. Um, but same exact principles apply. So if we are rendering out something for a customer to show them how efficient an operation runs, we might run something like that and roll it out really, uh, you know, really good quality. If you're watching it in real time, you're gonna be watching something a little, little nicer but probably closer to the previous one that you saw. And then this is just a, a screenshot just of our route planning software, but um, the, the, the genesis of what we're doing in this project came from us having done this ourselves before and A, having really good success with it and having it work and then B, going, there has to be a better way to do this than figure out how to do this all ourselves uh, and there has to be a faster way. So that's really where it all came in. Um, that's pretty much it, if anybody has any questions. If you have any questions, please raise your hand and we'll get you a mic. It's blinding up here. Sure. Oh, sorry. Hi, thank Hi. you for the talk. I was just wondering if you are able to talk about uh, the software tools you use to build the digital twin. Like, did you use something in-house or did you use, like, say, an existing game engine? Yeah, uh, no, we, so this was pre this project. Um, we, we did some, you know, shreddable experiments the previous year on um, what tech we wanted to deploy for the, specifically for the, the 3D visualization side. Um, we started with, we looked at Unreal and Unity. Um, U Unity, we did a POC of it, actually worked really well, but it created really cumbersome user experiences, big, big file loads and, and third party loaders, and we couldn't make it do everything we wanted to. So what, what we settled on was 3JS. Um, and and it, again, it's, it's, a little, it's a little less of a finished system like Unity, um, but we like it better because we're coders. I mean, we're developers by trade, and we can make it do anything we want. So the stuff that you saw there is generated by 3JS. Yeah, no worries. Anybody else? Thank you for the session. Thank you. Can't see where everybody is. At the back. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I had a question regarding the uh, demand forecasting use case. So I can only imagine that with uh, so many different products, uh, each product would have a different uh, demand pattern. So like, did you have a different time series models for each variation, like each location or each product combination, or how did it go? Yeah, yeah, basically the, I think what we're trying to settle on, and this is not, you know, Brent was going to come with us, he would have been more, better on the technical side, but I think what we were trying to settle on is not, you know, sort of reinventing a process for every SKU or category, but um, just training data against that SKU specifically. So we're not looking at SKU to SKU, we're not using one SKU to predict another SKU, we're using the data from that SKU. So we, we have a, a bit of a cold start you know, issue with something we've never seen before because we have nothing necessarily to compare it to. But um, yeah, the idea is that the the model is is agnostic to the product. It will it will sort of use the the historical sales data of that product um, to make predictions for that product only. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Thank you. Hi, way at the back here. Hey. Way back here. Yeah. Ah, got it. <laughs> Hi, I'm John from Group Capital. I have a lead for business development, maybe for you. Oh, nice. And uh, <laughs> Thank uh, you. I was to see a large uh, department store slash retailer that has warehouses down in Calgary, and they're here in Edmonton. And so I thought, well, 
they're number one in the business, so I'll go and spy, I mean, <clears throat> recon do some reconnaissance to see what they're doing. And uh, I waited late until almost past midnight when their skids showed up. And so you think that they really organize everything by skews, everything by everything. Okay, all that One of the senior people took me by the hand and he says, let me tell you what really happens, John. He says, you see this pallet here? The light stuff's on the bottom, the heavy stuff's on top. It doesn't line up with our shelving. <laughs> That's Walmart. You have no worries, but there's a lead for you for business. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the industry, I think it's like a restaurant, right? You don't necessarily want to go into the kitchen of your favorite restaurant and see what's actually happening back there. But it, it is an absolute mess of, you know, different processes, some that work, some that don't. Um, and, and, and just everybody's doing the best they can without the right data. And uh, But, yeah, we've seen, you know, one of our clients, um, they let the transport company plan the route, and they don't know what the route is. So they stage the product. So there might be, say... 26 pallets you can fit on a box truck. Um, they stage those 26 pallets at the dock door. They might have 10 of those going out or however many doors they have. It's taking up a huge amount of their space. It's just in random order. And then the, tr the, the truck driver comes. He knows what order he wants it in. He needs the one that's actually tucked against the door first because he needs to do uh, you know, first in, last out, right? And so he has to rearrange every single one of those 26 pallets, and they do that every single day for every single load that goes out. And as opposed to just going, if we optimize the route, we would stage it in the reverse order that it gets loaded in so that we would know that the last thing on was the first thing off. And so it's, it's lack of coordination, I think, that causes a lot of that. But it's not just them. It's everybody. It's, 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 people are the... Uh, you know, sort of the messy middle that messes all this stuff up. If it was all machines, it would be nice and clean, but um, it, it doesn't work that way. And our, our mandate is not to eliminate people. We talked about this in the session last night. Um, you know, when you go into, especially tech people, you know, you have a tendency to go, oh, you could, we could get rid of all the people. We could cut your, your staff by this much. We could cut your cost by this much. And they're like, you know I get my budget by headcount, right? Like, if you cut my staff, I lose my budget next year. That's absolutely the last thing I want to do. I do want to redeploy them. I want to put them in the areas that make sense. So we, our mandate is, you know, we don't want to create Iron Man. We, or t um, Terminator, we want to create Iron Man, right? We want to augment humans, not get rid of them. Um, and robotics is coming, and we're part of that, and we work with a lot of the companies that do that. Um, and so we have nothing against that. It, replace, you know, dangerous work that isn't, injures people. Uh, have robots do that. Um, but, but don't talk about getting rid of people. Talk about sort of redeploying them to do people things. Thank you. Uh, the reason for my bringing up this suggestion <clears throat> was I'm in sales and marketing responsible for bringing in business. How do we take your expertise uh, with, let's take Walmart or any other large retailer like that, how do we walk out with an order and some business for Amy and ourselves? Sweet. Nice. I like it. Thank you. Uh, hi. Have you considered uh, uh, tools like uh, NVIDIA Omniverse for simulation and visualization? Yeah, we, we've looked at uh, a number of simulation tools. Again, that would probably be more the Amy team or, or, uh, or, or Brent in our shop. Um, what, one of the, I, well, I still don't know whether this is right or wrong, but we, we love uh, tools that we can get inside them and we know how they work. Um, so we, you know, there's, there's a, a bunch of um, uh, OR platforms and simulation software and things like that that we entertain. Same as Unity, right? Like we get to a certain level, it's really, really easy to get a rough POC out and then you go, I need it to do this and I can't make it do that. Um, and so for, you know, better or worse, we're, we're sort of trying to, uh, David talked about the commercialization side. When we get to the commercialization side, we're going, do, do, do we have control over this thing or are we limited by it? And so there's probably tons of great tools out there and I know that the teams collectively have looked at a lot of them, but uh, we're, so, we're, we're sort of favoring what we can do with the infrastructure that we have if possible. So I want to build on the previous question that you got before this. You answered that we don't want to get rid of the humans. We want to keep the humans involved. But the other thing is when the humans are involved, they don't like change. What would be your advice when you're working with business stakeholders and the people you work with to say, 
how do I make sure you like this idea and how, that it makes sense because they're so used to, well, I don't want to change my world, I like my world. Yeah. That would be something I'd be like to hear your answer on that one. Yeah, I mean, you, you, people do not want to be sold, right? Like, I sell, that's part of what I do. They do not want to be sold. They want to come to their own conclusion. I, I, look, I, I listen in the conversation for when it became their idea all along, and you're like, okay, now they're, now they're convinced. Um, but but the, the issue with change is, um, you know, not listening, prescribing, uh, again, tech people, we love tech, right? Like we, we I, David mentioned it too, like we're early adopters, we're, I'm the first into everything, I'll try anything once. Uh, I, I've signed up for so many free trials of software, it's unbelievable. Um, but most people aren't like that, so you, you have to put your, you know, customer client hat on. And um, they, they really care about how it affects them. They, they, especially in a bigger company, uh, most people sell what it's gonna do for the company. And mo especially middle management, even at senior management, they don't care. They, they really don't care. They work there. <laughs> they didn't start it, they didn't found it. They could leave at any time and they probably get offers. You have to sell them on what it's going to do for them. So we create buyer personas for every different category. What, what does a driver want? Um, a driver's an interesting one because if, if you look at you know, somebody in the C-suite, they might be motivated by like, you know, this is gonna make me look good. I'm gonna get promoted. I'm gonna actually have a bigger budget, a bigger team. I'm gonna get all the things that I wanted. Um, I'm gonna raise sales. I'm gonna do this, that. Driver's number one motivation, I don't wanna get in trouble. That, that is absolutely, from all the studies that we've done, the number one, they don't actually care nearly as much about doing their job well as not getting in trouble. So if they think that the sensors are to watch them, <laughs> it's a, it's a, they don't like it. When they, when they find out that the sensors prevent things like, we've had drivers go, he spent two hours smoking outside my uh, establishment, and we're like, mm, didn't happen. 11 minutes, and yeah, he was waiting for the dock person to come back so that they could offload his truck for him because he doesn't control your pallet jacks. Um, then they start to see the benefit to them. So I, I think you have to, it's, it's no different than any technology. You have to sell the benefits to people, and you have to remember that it, everything is people. Nestle is it's a huge company, and there's still one person that's gonna make that final decision, and they're gonna listen to lawyers and IT people and um, there's there's peop the people who push the sale forward internally in a company and then there's the people whose entire job is to hold it back and I don't know if there's lawyers and IT people in the audience but I'm not saying this in a disparaging way their job is not to do anything Law lawyers would be your best served your lawyer will usually say don't do it don't don't do the project the lowest amount of risk is not to do it um, so if you forget when you're doing sort of a consortium sell that there's all these other stakeholders and the legal department does not care what the sales are. They care about mitigating risk, right? The IT department cares about security and scalability and robustness and am I gonna get phone calls at 12 o'clock at night on a Saturday because of this thing? So I think it's all about the, the people. I mean, David said the same thing in his presentation, right? It is, it is all people. Um, and. We, we have some partners in, in like spaces like blockchain, for example, and they, they're so rah-rah blockchain, and I'm not against blockchain at all, I think it's great, but if you're selling blockchain, you're probably not gonna make any sales. What, what does it do? <laughs> what does it do for you? I think that's the number one thing that people forget, and I don't think it's, I don't think the change management issues come from the people you're trying to change, it comes from your attitude towards them, right? Um, even being a little bit condescending. Like, I, I, I admit that in my early days when people would say, so-and-so in Vancouver or in Toronto is, is doing this and this is happening with Routique. And I'm like, well, tell them not to do that. Um, that that's kind of the de facto response from the tech. Well, that's not how we meant it to be used, right? Whereas really what you have to do is go, why are you doing it that way? Well, you know what, there's a reason for that. There's a method to their madness, hear them out. Sometimes you can convince them and sometimes you actually need to listen and you need to adapt. Hopefully that answers your question. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks.